Good afternoon, everybody. We are right on 2.30. In fact, it's just turned 2.31, so time to get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our Tactical Coaching Masterclass. Now, for those of you who haven't joined us before in one of our previous webinars, my name is Caitlin Siegler. I'm a director at GRIST and I'm your MC for today. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Kate Golby, who's our Senior Behavioural Analyst. And we have a special guest today, uh, Contract Manager at VicRoads, Jing Chang. Now, I'll introduce Jing and what our discussion is about today in a, just a little while, but a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Now, throughout the webinar, um, you're more than welcome to pop some questions into the chat or the Q&A buttons in your control panel. If you'd like to ask any questions of Jing or myself or Kate, and please do that as we move through the webinar, because we would love to hear from you. We'll have a full Q&A at the end of the session, uh, and we will be having a Q&A through during, um, a, a, with an interview style Q&A with Kate and Jing in a little while. Now, a little bit about today's webinar. Uh, first, a little bit about GRIST. Now, at GRIST, we simplify change and really inspire learning so people and organisations can thrive. We really believe that conversations are the lifeblood of an organisation, that small, simple changes made frequently deliver really big results, and that leaders are the single biggest influence on people and performance. And what is the fundamental conversation that leaders can have frequently that can really impact performance? Yes, that's right, it's coaching. That's what we're here to talk about. Now, if you're here, chances are you've already bought into uh, that, that coaching is really important. Uh, but if you joined one of our coaching webinars before, you'll notice that we talk a lot about tactical or behavioral coaching, and we talk a lot about ACDC. Now, if you're new to ACDC, I am gonna run through the model briefly at the end of the webinar, but essentially ACDC is a behavioral coaching model really designed to drive behavioral change. And a key part of ACDC is the focus on micro behaviors. Now you hear a lot about micro behaviors through this discussion, and all you really need to know about micro behaviors is that they're really teeny tiny behaviors. But not just that, they're behaviours that you are observable and accessible. You can see someone do them or you can hear them say them. Uh, they are uh, predictive of the outcome that you want to drive and they are 100% in the control of the individual displaying them. So when we talk about ACDC and tactical behavioural coaching, we're talking about driving behavioural change through making those really tiny changes one step at a time, those micro behavioural changes. Now, we also often um, focus on customer facing teams in our webinars. Uh, there's a really logical link there between what we do at GRIST and customer facing teams. But coaching isn't just for those frontline teams. Tactical coaching can really drive any outcome. And it's really applicable to any team looking to improve or change or lift performance. So back of house teams often struggle to coach behaviourally. It's not something that comes naturally to those sorts of teams that don't have that customer as a, as a reference point. And there's usually multiple roles in those teams doing very different tasks to each other and very different things even day to day. So how do you navigate what to focus on and how to coach to these sorts of teams? So today's special guest is a leader who's doing exactly that using the ACDC tactical coaching model to drive behavioural change, improve productivity, and really gain better team engagement through her leadership conversations. Now, I'm gonna hand over to Kate in a second, who's gonna lead our Q&A. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about our special guest, Jing Chang. So Jing started her career as a lawyer working in, Collins Street, uh, in a Collins Street law firm before moving to an in-house legal role and eventually ending up in her current field, working on complex, high-value commercial contracts. Now she joined Vic Roads just under a year ago and in, in, on day one of its new life as a joint venture partnership between the state of Victoria and a consortium of investors, which includes Macquarie and two other super funds. So outside of work, she enjoys time with her husband, her daughter and her cat and her hobby of playing board games together. So welcome Jing, um, thank you for joining us. I am going to hand over to Kate now, who is going to lead the uh, discussion with Jing. Thanks, Caitlin, and thanks for that excellent context for this, today's discussion. So, to, um, Jing, to begin with, I'd like to hear just a little bit more. Caitlin's given us a really brief overview of your role at Vic Roads. And so could you tell me a little bit more about your team and your role uh, and your team's role within the Vic Roads organisation? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Caitlin and, and Kate, for the introduction and, and easing with a, a nice, simple question. So. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Vic Roads, um, obviously Caitlin introduced that last year 
it was partially privatised essentially um, and so the state has entered into this joint venture with a group of investors and that joint venture is documented in something called the concession deed, um, a very long, very complex uh, document that my team um, manages. So we're the concession deed management team. Uh, I have three direct reports as well as a couple of peers and colleagues um, that work alongside me and so our team um, does a variety of different roles in relation to that concession deed that governs the relationship between the investors and the state, you know, talks about what we can do, what we need approval for, and, and a variety of other things. So um, we started on 15th of August with a team of literally me, <laughs> and now we've grown to a team of uh, seven plus our, our director, of our team and another. So um, obviously it was a completely new function completely new members of the team, new people to the organisation as well, and a pretty diverse mix of backgrounds. So some of us have legal or um, legal training or legal experience. Others have come from a procurement background or a, a data analytics background because the functions that they look after relate to um, KPI reporting and performance. Or in my case, my primary um, responsibility is that management of that nice long complex document and also the relationship we have with our state counterparts. So that's a very quick summary but please feel free to dive in with more. Absolutely and just for a, give us a bit of context in today's time, are you all face to face in the office? Are you some remote, some at, um, in the office? Where do you go? How do you guys communicate on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so we um, have, like many places, embraced hybrid working. Uh, we are roughly in the office two days a week and we as a team have chosen to have one anchor day where we all try and make it in, in person so that we get that collaboration together in person, not just via virtual face-to-face. -face. Uh, and we've really embraced that day by including a... Um, what, what, this is my initiative because of my love of board games, but we have our lunch together as a team and we sort of rotate, one of us will bring in a board game and play together as a team as well. So an extra bit of team bonding there. <laughs> um, and a very important question, your favourite board game as a team? Oh, um, I think the most recent one was called Telestrations. That was a big hit. So that was a mixture of what I would say Pictionary style drawing and mm -hmm. Chinese whispers where what you draw gets passed to the next person who has to guess what you draw but then they pass it on to the next person who has to draw that <laughs> guess. And so once it's done a full loop, what you thought was a beautiful, you know, house and garden may have turned into an Olympic swimming pool. I love it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so, all right. So you've been in this role for, you know, nine-ish months since August uh, and the team has grown from you to, um, to whatever it's sitting at these days. Um, and I guess you've probably been working with the ACDC model only in, in the more recent months. So you've probably moved from, I guess, more of a, a managerial sort of delegation role um, to a to more ACDC coaching approach. How have you found that shift? Yeah, in, in fact, this was my, this is my first role with a formal kind of management um, aspect to it. Previous roles, I've, I've never had direct reports or formal people management responsibilities. So this was a change for me both, I guess, um, you know, officially in a hierarchical sense, but also a change from doing this tactical leadership and coaching program through Brist. My, I guess, previous mindset of people managing or leading was of that, you know, maybe classic, you know, you, you delegate a task to um, a team member, you review their work and provide feedback and you keep doing that and, and hopefully see improvement in that way. Um, doing the tactical leadership and coaching program has really opened my eyes to the fact that that's maybe one element of being a people leader that is, is an important part of it, but certainly I've embraced the coaching mindset and the ACDC framework for achieving that, which is, I think, a more sustainable and um, I feel like in the long run, it's a better way of growing um, capacity and um, confidence in my team members by kind of drawing it out of them and, and nurturing them rather than being a directive manager, being more of a coach and a support and guide. So um, for me, that's part of why I'm here because I you know, really enjoyed the learning program 
um, wholeheartedly try to adopt, you know, the lessons and, um, you know, apply them in my day-to-day -day management of my team. And how have you found that uh, that move to the, the coaching, drawing the answers out of your team rather than, I guess, the easier version, which is to, to tell them what to do and hope they do it? Yeah, it's, uh, I think the one thing that I found the most difficult, um, or, or two maybe things, one is, I guess, any change in behaviour is it takes a, some time. So when you're trying to adopt a new habit or introduce a new practice, you know, the first few times you, you do it, it feels unnatural or you have to really be consciously thinking about it. Um, so that was, I think, the first hurdle for me. And in a recent coaching session with Mimi, we talked about the idea of moving from conscious competence where you are really focusing on doing the thing that um, in this case coaching to hopefully moving to unconscious competence where it's now an ingrained habit and you do it almost as a muscle memory item so for me I'm still in the I think conscious competence element and, and the second part of that the reason I think it's been a, um, a shift that's been difficult is because it takes more time any time that you need to just fire off an email directing someone of a list of tasks is a much shorter process or, or a shorter conversation. Coaching naturally takes, you know, the time to listen, to hear and draw out from your coachee their thoughts, um, to, you know, make sure that they're buying in and that you're not the only one that's having a conversation. And so when we all have busy lives, multiple meetings and demands, it's a much faster thing to, to, to revert to that style of delegation rather than using each opportunity and then it's not the case that I do it every time but I try and look for the chances where I can say actually here's a moment where I can coach this out of my team member rather than tell them what they need to do and it's a bit about handing over control I suppose as well isn't there yeah yeah and uh, as a former lawyer and many of us will tell you that's not an easy thing to do you you feel like um you've handed over uh, that, that micromanagement of control of the exact outcome. And I think that, again, is a shift in the mindset I'm trying to make, which is that the outcome can be reached in multiple ways. And in fact, having your team members choose, I guess, the micro behaviour that they want to focus on and buying into the um, change they need to make is actually um, more likely to be a sustainable process and you're going to have a higher likelihood of achieving that outcome than if you as a manager tell your team today this is the goal everyone this is your task to achieve that goal and away you go so I think because I am conscious of that I believe in the, the process I guess and, and I'm happy to keep applying it until we continue to see improved results. Excellent yeah and do you think that um, you as a uh, as I suppose, yeah, a, a coach, do you find that you need to uh, set more of a, a regular rhythm or a schedule for yourself rather than be it ad hoc feedback? Yeah, for me, um, I kind of assumed that my normal leadership would be just ad hoc, you know, in the moment when a task or an issue came up. But the coaching cadence that, you know, I've learned in this program about having a regular one-on-one -on -one coaching session not just a, a feedback or work review session is something I've really adopted so one of the things I've tried to do as a I guess a personal micro behavior for me is to make sure that at the end of each coaching session I've had I immediately go and schedule the next one for two weeks time so then you're not going to lose momentum because you've left it two weeks and then it's a busy week so um, and similarly for other activities like the team huddles that my team um, do as well again putting it in at the end of that team huddle session so that it's embedded for a fortnight's time um, I think it it's made me reflect how much the initial leader has to the, the initial investment has to be done by the leader to make that again embedded as a habit um, go from a micro behavior that you're consciously always doing to one that you almost just by rote hopefully implement um, but over time as well I think I'm seeing that the upfront investment for me is paying off because I'm seeing my team members take more and more ownership of the, the team micro behaviour and goal. And so 
over time, hopefully my role is again, just gentle guidance or, you know, calibration sessions and less directive or less sort of shepherding them further towards the goal. Absolutely. And I think that you, team members that can, who see their coach uh, you know, invested in their improvement by making time to sort of spend time with them to see them and, in, and help them and coach them, you know, that gives them a, a, an extra bit of confidence and um, I guess a, a boost to, to want to improve, right? I think so. I think any time, you know, people invest their time and effort into you, it's a, I guess, a little bit of an ego boost because you know that um, they, they have de- dedicated their time to, you know, supporting you in whichever way um, you choose. And in particular as well, making sure that that coaching session remains focused on that coaching of a particular micro behaviour rather than devolving into general work discussion or, you know, um, of feedback on a particular piece of work. And I've always, I think, been conscious to make that delineation. So yes, we might eventually finish the session and then move on, but I'm focusing on coaching this micro behavior and whatever ideas or other discussions come up, let's park those and pick them up for another session. So that's um, yeah, something I'm conscious of. Excellent. Yeah. Great. And so you spoke um, up front about working with a team of really varied roles. Um, and so how have you taken this approach of, you know, tactical coaching to micro behaviours and adapted that for a team that is, is really so, so diverse in their, in their um, day-to-day job? Yeah, that was a, it was a tough one in the um, initial sort of TLC session with Mimi trying to identify an opportunity statement that would apply to the whole team and a micro behaviour that the entire team could implement both because it could relate to everyone's roles as well as something that we could do frequently enough. I think, as Caitlin mentioned earlier, if you've got a team who are all functionally performing the same role and in that role performing the same interactions regularly, I think it can be easier to identify uh, something to work on. Whereas in my team, we sort of had to take a step back and look less, I think, at a... um, a work product, but more, I guess, um, treating our internal colleagues in the business as a, a customer in a sense. And so we, we focused on our interactions with them as the, the kind of opportunity. And so the micro behavior we all chose was to let our colleagues know how the concession D team can help them. And so it was sort of a broad enough opportunity statement and micro behavior that people could adapt it to what their role or their interactions um, related to, but it was still a, a small enough kind of um, change or micro behaviour that everyone felt that they could perform it at least a few times a week consistently. Fantastic. And as part of those conversations when you're in your one-on-ones or in your, your team huddles, when you're talking about those uh, micro behaviours that you're going to focus on, I know we are very guilty of um, of basically focusing on face-to-face customer teams. I love that you've sort of adapted that and go, well, who, who are our customers? They might be the, the end of the line, but who are we interacting with as a customer? That's fantastic. So how have you, have you found you've had to adapt the ACDC model because of that shift? Yeah, I think um, ACDC, I feel like really is well adapted for the, um, for the kind of, behaviour or activity that you would repeat maybe 10 times or more a day whereas in my team um, we might not have interactions with our colleagues at all in a day sometimes you know the work in sort of back office can be pretty isolating and focused and that's why a lot of people often end up working from home and not interacting Mm. so one thing I found as well is that you know different team members have different levels of I guess understanding and awareness of you know what's happening in the business and the way that they're behaviours are having an impact on that. So um, at the beginning, I was adhering to the ACDC framework in micro detail, you know, trying to literally go through each and in order as well. And so I'd have my little um, sort of cheat sheet there as a bit of a reminder. But I found that after the first few coaching sessions, you you know, you're naturally a bit stiff because you're going to refer back to a um, set of almost rules. Whereas when I kind of was a little more confident in knowing that that's the framework that's there as a support a guide a reference for me 
not a strict set of rules, I was able to adapt that to each um, team member in each session. And so some sessions I might change up the order in which, you know, particular items I, um, you know, hit. And others I might think, no, we really know very well what the focus is, so I don't need to re-emphasise and reiterate that. Or in others, you know, the buy-in might have happened from the team member early on, and so it felt artificial to then finish that section with another question, oh, is, is that something you're committed to? So um, for me, that confidence building um, has been great because I know that it's always there as a reference point to go back to the, the GIST online, um, you know, uh, little videos and the itemized sort of sections of micro behavior, but it's also one that, um, you know, is a set of guidelines, principles rather than um, IKEA furniture building instructions that you must follow in order. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, behaviors like, say, a practice that would happen in a a coaching session with a frontline staff member it might be absolutely a conversational practice, but in your um, your coaching sessions, that would look quite different, right? Yeah, that one was an that one. The practice was certainly an interesting one because I think um, a lot of our interactions are also um, via email rather or Teams messages. Maybe not always a um, a face to face or a voice or, or video um, conversation. And so we did do practice both in team huddles as well as uh, the one-on-one, -on -one, especially at the beginning when I think everyone in the team was very new to this concept, what's a micro behaviour, uh, what does it mean, something you can see or something you can hear. So we did a lot of practising, I guess, calibration of, all right, this is how, you know, Josh in my team approached it and this is how Katie in my team tried it out. But over time as those sessions evolved and my team got more and more comfortable and, uh, you know, practised at it, I didn't always feel the need to throw it in to all the coaching sessions and, you know, might reflect and say, oh, I, I observed in that email or I observed your, you, you said that in that call and, you know, how did, how did you feel about that? Is it coming more naturally to you? So I think, again, it, it developed organically. Absolutely. And it might turn into, you know, a brainstorm in a team huddle or something like that. You adapt it to work for your situation. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so now we've heard a little bit about how you use the you know, tactical coaching, ACDC, to coach your team. I understand you're also using it as a, a self-assessment. So can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, about that and you know, what you've found yourself at, and what you've seen as um, some benefits? Sure. Well, like probably many people, I don't like the sound of my own voice recorded <laughs> and replayed back to me. But um, as part of the commitment to the program and developing as a leader, you know, the fact that the, the GIST Online um, platform has that self-assessment, um, I guess, platform that, you know, I embraced it wholeheartedly, if slightly unwillingly. <laughs> so I, you know, recorded the first few sessions of coaching I had with my various team members and then um, listened back to them while also checking off, you know, whether I had addressed the various micro behaviours that make up the ACDC framework. And I think I was surprised at both how well I did in some areas, as well as the fact that in my mind, I thought I had covered that off during the conversation that I'd had, but on listening to it, I was able to observe, okay, maybe that was more of an attempt, but I didn't fully perform the behaviour. But I think the better value I actually got out of it was around my delivery style and um, less so much the, the micro behaviours, but more things like whether I sounded natural or stilted. Um, certainly more stilted at the beginning because mm. I was following, you know, very religiously along. Then also things like noticing that in the earlier coaching sessions that I did, I was talking probably more than 40, 50, 60% of the time. And I know that the ideal coaching kind of framework, which we spoke about earlier, is drawing it out of my coachee rather than directive. So uh, the third thing I think um, was the biggest learning for me and the one that I chose to focus on as my own micro behaviour as a leader was my habit of trying to finish sometimes my the sentences my coachee was starting to give an answer and I'd sort of jump in and say it along with them or maybe even preempt what they were going to say. And so for me, listening to that, three self-assessments in a row where I did that was a really stark reminder that how you think you're doing and what your own perception is is potentially quite different if you listen to it in um, a recording a few days later so that 
that was the micro goal, micro behavior goal I set for myself. The second lot of um, self-assessments I did, definitely noticed improvements on a few of those areas, but again, not perfect. And, but I could hear and see progress. And so for me, that's, I think, something I'm going to continue to, to do ad hoc, you know, do a self-assessment recording so that I can just pick up whether or not I need to, again, focus that to make it go from conscious competence to that unconscious competence level um it, it's just yeah a good again reminder of things that you're not aware of that you can change when you become aware of them absolutely and I'm sure you know purely because of the fact that you're so wrapped up in you know currently just getting used to coaching right so you've got so many things going on in your mind the deliveries <laughs> you know of of the information it, you go oh well I know, I know how to speak to people. I've been doing it for years. But until you go back and listen to it without all those other things going through your mind, it's really hard to be um, to, to take a step back and actually see it, how you know your your team member may be receiving it. And I think it's 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 invaluable to um to get that kind of perspective, I suppose. And I love I love that that self-assessment purely, of course, I hate listening to myself as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's worth <laughs> worth the pain to go back and re-listen. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think the fact that I knew that the self-assessments were purely for my own benefit, you know, it wasn't being listened to by Grist or my manager or anyone else in the program kind of <clears throat> helps because you know that it's purely benefiting you and your team members that you're going to be coaching. And so um, you should have hopefully no ego about that. And I think, again, anytime you have an objective view of something as opposed to your own unintentional bias or, or perception um, is a good just check-in point. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Linda, so how's the chat going? So we've got, have we got any questions coming through? Well, we've actually got a, lot, a couple of comments here, which I'll read out in a second, but if, if there are yeah. any questions for Jing or for Kate or myself, um, please put them up. We'd love to love to hear from you. But a couple of comments. Dave has uh, just mentioned, she, he said, Jing, that's a really nice insight for me, using the framework to guide the conversation rather than a set of rules. And I must say, I actually noted down your um, your analogy there because I loved that talking about it as principles, not IKEA instructions. I think that was <laughs> a really nice way of putting it, which is so hard to get across when you're learning a new framework. It's so tempting to just follow it letter by letter. And, and yet really that that freedom comes from seeing it as those guiding principles. I love how you put that there. So thanks, Dave, for the comment in, in Jing. That was a very nice insight. Um, Mimi has also put up a comment saying, thank you so much for sharing your experience and learnings to Jing. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with you through the Tactical Leadership Program at Vic Roads. So she's loved watching you grow and learn through the journey. And uh, sorry, she needs to leave for a coaching pod <laughs> with some of your peers. <laughs> um, now, I do have a question. I do have a question here from Dave. He has a question about coaching a new team. Given that everyone is so new and obviously there's a lot more to learn to get up to speed, do you find the ACDC approach to be effective when the team have got so much to learn? Uh, what I think I like about the ACDC approach is that it's so micro, you know, I, um, it's not about, and I'm going to use an analogy that Mimi gave us during our coaching, it's it's not about when you're learning to improve your tennis game. It's not about improving every element of your tennis game. It's about focusing down to really a tiny little building block. And when you focus on that, it feels much more achievable. I think that whole idea of a 1% plus 1% plus 1% over time, but at the beginning, just focus on getting that 1% embedded, becoming a habit, becoming unconsciously something you incorporate. And it's something that I also in my team huddles with my team reminded them that you know at the moment the focus is still on our process or you know the performance of that and not on whether or not the outcome or the data is showing a huge spike in change you know that these things just like doing any exercise you know your muscle doesn't um or, or spontaneously grow after one tough gym session it, it kind of grows over the accumulation of many consistent weeks and months of gym going and so um, obviously it's nice to get those small wins and our team has been able to see that but again I sort of focus them on the fact that what we're doing um, is getting used to the the practice of doing it and at a point in time where the practice of doing it is you know a, a habit formed then we can look at you know choosing something else and so not overwhelming everyone on top of their their day-to-day -day job as well. Yeah, great. 
I love that. Um, I've got another question which follows on nicely from that, Jing. Uh, it was, uh, it's, I've got a question here. It says, I know I've also found it tough to bring practice into my coaching sessions more regularly. Um, and, and I know you mentioned that before, Jing, that the, the practice, it, it took a little while to get used to that in the, the coaching the team huddles. Have you got any tips on how to bring more practice into your coaching sessions or your, or your team huddles? Um, oh, tips. <laughs> I think for the team huddle, it, I think that was almost an, um, a more fun way of practicing because um, it we used again. I just can't sing Mimi's praises enough. But in our um, coaching sessions, she got us to essentially throw a whiteboard marker to each other, and it was like the person who caught it was the one who was um, having a turn to practice, and then they'd throw it to the next person, and so it kind of didn't feel too. Um, intimidating in that way because everyone had a chance it was quick it was just focusing on that little bit of practice not the whole conversation not the whole uh, you know um everything that's involved so in our team huddle I, I did a similar thing and you know I volunteered myself first but then made sure that that we went around the team and we didn't focus on good or great we just focused on doing it and um as I said as well recently in our team huddle you can't improve or um, perfect something that you're not doing so you've got to do it first and do it consistently before you can almost organically identify ways you can improve yourself as well as as a coach you know help and support ways that you can make that from something you're doing to something you're doing well to something you're doing really well and I love that idea of um, practicing as a group as well because you're you're obviously you're getting your chance to do the practice but you're seeing everybody else's practice so you're absorbing that learning as well so especially for a team like you say who don't necessarily do repetitive tasks every day um, you're you're getting that repetition as a form of practice with everybody having a go yeah and you know it's a team like you collaborate and you learn from each other. Um, one of the Vic Road's values is, you know, uh, we have care, share and dare and sharing and caring is, is kind of um, two values that you can do in a team huddle where you hear how your team members are doing it. You kind of, they, they start to, you know, sort of um, play off each other's ideas, borrow um, each other's ideas and get a sense of, you know, helping the whole team um, with that activity. Fantastic. I've got another question here um, from Tara. And she's asking, how often would you be coaching, practicing with your team? And do uh, and you uh, do you do more of one session, um, one session or group sessions? Uh, or do more one-on-one -on -one sessions or group sessions? Which wh what's the sort of balance, I suppose, between those different forms of coaching? Yeah. Yeah. So um, for me, because I have three direct reports, it feels like a manageable number that I can do one-on-ones with them each fortnight. Um, mm -hmm. And in addition, our team is only um, a total team size of seven and we have a slightly smaller team that's doing the, the tactical leadership coaching side. So we're doing a fortnightly team huddle as well, but we alternate the weeks. So one week I have my one-on-ones with each of my reports and I try and schedule them on different days. So, you know, it's a 20 minutes that I can definitely always find time for. And I think that's, again, the, the prioritizing of that coaching time. It's a 20 minute session that it's absolutely worth the investment in my people to spend 20 minutes every fortnight with each of them specifically on coaching. And again, as a team, we do a team huddle. I set the limit to 20 minutes as well every fortnight and we can absolutely achieve that as well. And I think that's been a really good balance for us um, so far. I, I sympathize with those who are maybe more in the customer facing roles where you have multiple reports is probably a, more difficult and something where you, may, you know, express ACDC might or more team huddles might make sense. But for me, I found that this is um, a, a good cadence. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I think that's all of our um, questions from the audience. Caitlin, do you have anything else you'd like to ask Jean? Uh, I do. Apologies for that. Zoom kicked me out there for a second. <laughs> but back, hopefully I'm back for the long term. Um, I don't know where you got to, Kate, but uh, Jing, yes. I, I do have a, a, another question for you. Um, I, I really wanted to hear about um, just an example of a micro behaviour that you're using in your team at the moment um, for us, um, given that you are working back of house. I'd love to hear and how it's working. Yeah, so our team being a new function to Vic Roads and a, a kind of a 
awkwardly named concession deed management team. People don't really know what that means. Um, one, I guess the opportunity statement our team identified was that we do want our colleagues to better know who, who we are as a team, what we do, how we can help. So the micro behaviour we settled on was to actually tell people about our SharePoint site that we were launching internally. So, um, and that was to be, you know, um, something that you can add on to a conversation or, you know, bring up at the end of a, an email that might be about a, a work topic. But we thought the micro behaviour of actually directing people's attention to it would help that SharePoint site get gain views. Um, it's kind of like an easy add on to any conversation that you didn't maybe require too much um, change to the way they already operate. And it's that 1% change rather than the big wholesale, you know, redo everything. What we noticed was um, using the data analytics on the page that at the beginning of the whole TLC program, it was only our internal team members who were viewing the, the website page. And, you know, um, you could tell that by the number of uh, unique viewers, I think. Since we started adapt, adopting that micro behavior of finding a way to tell people that the SharePoint site, we've noticed an increase in the number of unique viewers and um, not only in the number of unique viewers, but also people using a query form that's embedded on the website rather than reaching out to us by email, which is, you know, the standard way. So it's really great to have that quantitative data as well, because, um, you know, it's, it's a nice way of showing people the evidence as opposed to sort of relying only on qualitative reports or feelings um, about whether or not your behaviour is having an impact. I really love that because that was going to be my next question to you and you've answered it beautifully without me even asking was just how do you measure it and know that it's working and I think you've got a beautiful example of just marrying exactly what you're saying that quantitative data is so important to then know you're on the right track and I'm, I imagine that's pretty exciting to share that with the team when they see those results those hard that hard evidence Shing. Oh absolutely I mean and that was the the directing people for our SharePoint was actually um, an amplifier that we did so our original micro behavior that we worked on was just to tell people about the concession deed team you know in some way educate them about what, who we are or what we do or whatever people wanted to, to focus on we decided that that was going pretty well people were feeling com comfortable doing that and so we added in that we would direct people to our SharePoint at the at a point where we decide to amplify what we're doing not move on to a completely new micro behavior but sort of add a little bit to what we were already doing and that amplification was the way that we could see the quantitative results. Um, we did have some great anecdotes. So qualitatively, I suppose, we had um, one of my team members say she'd met a new person who, um, on learning that my team member was a member of the concession deed team, said, oh, yes, I know all about you. And so we'd had no interactions with that person, but obviously the message was getting through by the other colleagues that, um, you know, had heard of us because we our self-promotion. But it is also obviously great to see the data that we can, you know, also feed up to senior management because sometimes I think, you know, that there's a bit of a focus on, uh, well, what are your results or KPIs or, you know, what's the data change? Um, so it's good to have both stories. And a really nice way of linking those, what your activity is as a leader and how that's actually impacting your team and impacting your results. I really love that. That's terrific. Um, uh, I, I, I do have a question from Tara actually as well, just another one. We've got a lot of questions today, it's terrific. Mm. Um, Tara's also asked, do any other departments at Vic Roads use Grist and what made you engage with Grist for your team? Um, I might actually take that one, Jing, if that's okay. <laughs> and yes, we are actually working across all departments in Vic Roads, so both customer facing and back of house. Um, it, it was something that we started some work with Vic Roads quite a few years ago with looking at behavioural frameworks and how that might work in the context of their organisation when they were looking at doing something differently. And then, as Jing has mentioned, went through this whole process of privatisation. So their priorities probably shifted into going, we need to pause this, uh, how we're going to integrate um, these leadership coaching and behavioural frameworks into our business until we get through that privatisation 
part. And then we came back in uh, just at the beginning of this year to work with the team as a whole to really look at with this new chapter in Vic Roads, um, you know, the next stage of their, their organisational life, how uh, they can actually set themselves up to, uh, to build the leaders of their future. So Jing is a beautiful example of how um, we've got a whole bunch of new leaders doing a whole lot of different functions at Vic Roads. And the GRIST uh, program was really about bringing that sort of leadership to light. What does being a leader in Vic Roads look like and how do we set ourselves up so we can actually deal with those challenges that are going to come across our plate in the future in this new way of working? So that's, Jing, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that as well. I think, um, well, you, you've given such a beautiful encapsulation of it. I think the, the one thing I'd add is that I'm really grateful that the Vic Roads leadership decided to extend the program to the back of office um, corporate services team members because I think and you know the usual focus um would be on your customer facing team members but the fact that they extended it to back of um, office meant that someone like me got an opportunity to join the program learn from it and I think as well have that consistency across the organization which um I also feel like when leadership is about one person that person's departure or you know things that happen to that person mean that you, you kind of lose that. When leadership is a cultural um, sort of, uh, like the, the, the general, all people leaders at all levels have adopted, have, have done the training, ad adapted it in their own teams and for their own approach, but have a consistency and understanding, then I think the organisation as a whole benefits because yes, leaders will come in and out, but um, I guess the core of the organisation and their leadership values stays the same, hopefully. Oh, I love that. That's a perfect encapsulation of exactly what, what the objectives were there, Jing, of, of, of the program as a whole. And I think uh, one thing we've learned out of this program, uh, another large objective was to sort of break down those, those silos between that sort of back of office, front of office and the customer facing. And I think what you're doing with your team and that micro behaviour approach you're taking is a beautiful demonstration about how that's actually affecting the stakeholders right across your business, that it's actually integrating what you do um, across more holistically. So it's really nice to see that happen, coming out in action with that. Um, I do have I do have another question now. <laughs> Jing, how hard did you find the ACDC model to learn and did it take long for you to feel like it was being effective when you were implementing it? Uh, so in terms of the learning, I did all of the little snippet, you know, the video snippets, and I, I would say I probably didn't, I took my time not to do it all in the one session, and I think that was helpful because it is a lot of material. It's all new. I feel like you can only retain a certain amount from each bit. So I love the fact that it's bite-sized um, and engaging and humorous as well, because I think you you that's much better than a dry workbook that you read from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how long I felt like it took, certainly, as I said, in my self-assessment, I was doing the first few coaching sessions very much with the, the ACDC micro behaviors in front of me and it wasn't almost until I'd done the self-assessment and was matching up what I was doing with what those elements were that I think that helped me, um, yeah, build it into my muscle memory a little bit more slowly. Mm. And so, again, it, for me, it was about practising multiple times. You know, you can't improve your form until you've practised and, and done it and tested what works, what feels organic, what feels hard and needs to be focused on. So... Um, I'm, I very much still feel like I'm in the progress section, not in the, you know, <laughs> um, here's me as a wise guru telling people, but I think that's the nice um, thing that people can get value out of it at all stages of being a leader and at all stages of embedding that ACDC framework into their own leadership style. Oh, I love that. That's a, a terrific answer. And I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate for, I mean, we're always a big advocate at GRIST for application and that learning really has to be an application. I think you've got a beautiful summary there of that you don't have to be a master at ACDC to get out and start using it. Like you can just start using those little bite-sized chunks immediately. Um, well, that brings us to a really beautiful segue into just looking just a little bit to cover off um, what the ACDC model is and the GIST platform, which we've mentioned several times today. Um, but first, I just want to say a huge thank you to Jing and to Kate for a really terrific discussion. And I also want to say thank you for the questions, uh, because we've had tons of questions today on the chat, and I really appreciate um, just the interaction from the audience. It does make this session so much better when we've got lots of different perspectives and questions um, to get through. 
So uh, a little bit about ACDC. Um, we have looked, talked about a lot about it today. Some of you will be very familiar with ACDC, but for those of you uh, who aren't, this is a quick, just two minute summary of what ACDC tactical leadership is and um, how you can use it on the gist. So you can see the model up there as it is. It is It has four phases, agenda, current state, desired state, commitment. Um, as Jing really beautifully pointed out, these are principles and not necessarily rules. There is a logical flow to ACDC, but under each of these phases, you find five micro behaviours, which are really the tiny moments that ensure that your coaching conversations are really effective in driving real behavioural change and tangible performance outcomes. Now, ACDC isn't necessarily a really long haul sit down for hours um, to explain a, a model. It can be done very quickly or it can be done over an extended one-on-one um, -on -one session. So it's really adaptable as we've talked about today for whatever situation you're in and whatever team that you have. Um, really easy to, to move it around to what suits uh, the, the person you're talking to. Uh, now, we you can learn ACDC really simply on the GIST. So the GIST it, it, it is uh, our online platform. And as Jing sort of mentioned, it's a platform that really has little tiny bite-sized videos that take you through each of those 25 micro behaviours um, within ACDC, which includes some delivery skills in there. And it's really one of the simplest ways to learn that model with um, very little um, very little effort to sort of get into those what each of those behaviours mean. Um, it just takes you through that coaching model. You learn them through those short, funny videos, and then that's cemented through anchoring activities and applying your skill in real life and assessments. So it's that sort of application and assessment, um, that self-assessment we've heard a bit about today that really makes that ACDC and learning it on the gist really sing. Uh, what we find is self-assessment, as, as Jing has spoken about uh, beautifully today, is it, it does, it just highlights things that you would not necessarily be self-aware of if you didn't listen to yourself back. Really uncomfortable thing to do at first, to listen to yourself, um, talk through a coaching session, but invaluable if you really want to get that speed to competence and really get a good understanding about what behaviours you're demonstrating and not, and what sort of effect they're actually having on your coachee to sort of analyse your coaching conversation from a more objective point of view. And you can really dig into then all of those little things that you may not have been aware of, of what you could do differently or what you can improve or actually things that you might be doing really well that you weren't aware of as well. Um, gives you whole tons of, um, of areas of opportunity. So um, the GIST and um, ACDC, these are both products that um, GRIST uh, we do every day with lots of leadership organisations right around the country. Uh, but if you would like to know more or if you want to know a little bit more about how ACDC or the GIST works, um, you can go on our website and we have tons of information on our website. Uh, we also have all of our past coaching webinars available in our events section of our website. And um, we did actually go through ACDC, the ACDC model in quite a lot of detail in some calibration webinars that we did about this time last year. So if you're interested into digging into further about what the ACDC model is about, you can certainly jump on our website and have a look through those videos um, and you've got the, the details there. Uh, if you'd like to know more about GRIST and what we do, um, please either you know follow us on LinkedIn or get in contact. You have my email address there on screen. So feel free to email uh, if you have any questions about what you've seen today or if you want to talk a little bit more about how GRIST can help um, with the coaching in your organisation. But finally, on, on behalf of everyone at GRIST, I want to say another huge thank you to our special guest, Jing. It was really lovely to have you on board today. A terrific discussion and really good detail around how we can use ACDC and tactical behavioural coaching and back of office teams. I also want to say thanks to my colleague, Kate, for leading that discussion. Thank you, Kate. And a huge thank you to everyone who's listening and for coming along. Um, really terrific questions. And we love to have you on uh, for these coaching webinars. Now, our next tactical coaching webinar is in August. Uh, you can sign up on our website if you want to register to come along to that. We'll be looking at um, tactical coaching and mindset. We would love to see you then. Uh, in the meantime, have a terrific rest of the week and we'll see you in August. Thank, Thank you, you, Caitlin and Kate Thank for having you. me. Um, yeah, it's uh, been a very fun experience getting to, to talk about my experience and um, in a really sort of welcoming mm -hmm. environment. So. Um, hope that everyone enjoyed hearing my experience. That's what I can only say it's my experience, but um, I think, yeah, learning comes from hearing lots of different perspectives. And so that's just mine to throw my hat in the ring there. Oh, 100%. And Jing, we would love to have you on again, uh, maybe in six months or 12 months down the track and see how things are progressing. I will absolutely be following you up to come back on to another tactical mm -hmm. coaching webinar. No. So we'll discuss then. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so try that in. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, everybody.